the role of governments in drug price negotiations, the UK experience, and it's very much the experience of uh, my experience at NICE. In Britain, something like 95 or 98% of healthcare is provided by the National Health Service. You have the right to drugs and treatments that have been recommended by NICE if your doctor says they are clinically appropriate. We already negotiate prices, but instead of the government doing it on your behalf, it's private plans that negotiate prices for you. The way these private plans negotiate prices is to say, if you offer me a discount, I'll make sure your competitor is not covered by my plan. The CBO agrees that we want drug price negotiation uh, for Medicare will not uh, save a lot of money. Somewhere between 80 and 90 percent of Americans favor uh, Medicare price negotiation. Price negotiations will not work unless the company knows that you may just walk away. Right, but that's the question. Yeah. Will Americans and be able to say, say no? And, and will the politicians and, start interfering exactly. when you do say no? And as with regulation of utilities, when a utility wants a rate increase, they have to go before the regulators. So if a drug company had to go before a regulation board and say, here are our costs, here's a fair profit, suddenly you're having an honest conversation. So you've got a marketplace now that is literally being manipulated by just three players who are keeping their prices going up in lockstep. Sometimes the, there's only one generic manufacturer. Regulators, you know, like the FDA and my organization, we ought to be really focusing on what we can do to reduce the cost of drug development because otherwise we won't get new drugs. You know, consumers won't be able to pay and thank you very much to the citizens of the United States for paying over the odds compared to the United Kingdom for new drugs. You do pay more than anyone else in the world. Twice as much. Three trillion dollars a year in spending. The world average for healthcare spending in terms of GDP is 12%. Oh, that's the OECD. Um, our 17% is about twice the Britain world is, average. Britain is 8%. Another player comes in, they're going to drive prices down to kind of two cents a pill. Right. And therefore, the other player doesn't come in because they say, what's the point of entering this market if I'm sure. going to compete? But then that, that leaves one firm in the market and they can charge whatever they want. Right. The big picture question, which is, yes, there are some anti-competitive practices and maybe we should be spending more time enforcing our current laws against those anti-competitive practices. But at the same time, like this cure for hep C is phenomenal. You take one small pill for three months and all that suffering is gone. You've got these corporate interests that are directly threatened by a cure. If the cure came out, would we be willing to say, oh, well, only the rich are going to get access because it's going to be priced so expensively? Because there's no point having a cure for hep C where 90% of the people can't afford it. If we regulate prices too much and we lose opportunity for such cures for other diseases like cancer or diabetes or Alzheimer's and so on, there could be a huge loss to society. What we regard as innovative is uh, uh, products for unmet medical need that make a substantial difference to the lives of the people who've got it. The grave danger of not just monopoly pricing, but predatory pricing. And it's exactly what we're seeing now because consumers, especially American consumers, can't shop around for health care. In that case, I, like Federal Trade Commission or you know, whoever should be going in and saying these prices are anti-competitive. We want to make sure there's a reasonable rate of return so they invest in the infrastructure. I think we could do a lot by reducing the costs of clinical trials. The problem is the pricing of medicines in most countries is what the market will bear. Mm -hmm.